Ever since Links were introduced, Link 2s have been some of the most useful and probably the most played of their kind, but that doesn't mean all of them are good. In this video, we're going to cover some of the worst ones Konami has produced so far. Starting off at number 10, we have Linkerbell. This is a Link to Earth Fairy with downward pointed arrows and 1500 attack. It only takes two monsters to be made, and its sole line of text is its summoning condition, which says it can't be Link summoned unless you have at least three more cards in your extra deck than your opponent. This monster just doesn't have much going on for it. I mean, yeah, it has nice arrows and generic materials and an okay attack for Link 2, but its summoning requirements make it too much of a bother. Since it relies specifically on your opponent's extra deck, it'll almost always be a gamble whether you can even summon it or not, unless you've got some reason to be playing no extra deck. Going first, you won't get to make it unless you've managed to rip at least three cards out of your opponent's extra deck somehow. But if you're doing that much, you're certainly not doing it to get access to a vanilla Link 2. Going second, well, yeah, it's going to be live much more often because your opponent will have gone through their extra deck plays. But it's not going to be of any help breaking a board compared to any of the other playable Link 2s. Even within its own niche of just being a body with decent arrows, it's outclassed by Lanferinkus, which is pretty much the same exact card except without any restrictions on its summon and only 300 less attack and it came out a couple of years before Linker Bell. Even so, while this may have been valuable in the early days of Master Rule 4, no one is playing stuff like Land for Rinkus anymore, for the same reason why you wouldn't run a main deck vanilla for no reason. At least it is useful in setting the power level basis for this list. And at number 9, we have Prog Leo. This is a Link to Light Cyrus monster. It takes only two monsters to be made, except tokens, and its effect is that, during the main phase, if you control this Link Summon card, you can banish it and another one of your monsters it points to to reborn a Link monster from either graveyard, but it gets banished when leaving the field. While Prog Leo is at least more consistently made than Linker Bell, that's where its advantages end, as it might as well have no tax with its effect box. To use its ability, you're going to first of all need another Link monster with actually good arrows so that Prog Leo can actually point to something, a monster you don't mind banishing, and a Link monster in either graveyard you want to revive. That's at least four monsters worth of materials you need in order to bring back a Link. At which point, why are you not just making a monster from your extra deck the regular way? I mean, yeah, you could steal an opponent's boss, but you'd need to have it outed in the first place and then set all this mess up in order to do it. And a lot of Link monsters are only useful when you're Link summoning them anyway. When you try to look beyond that for inequalities in Prog Leo, well, it's just a Link 2 with really bad arrows. The most interesting thing about this monster is that it was in the last wave of video game promos we've ever gotten, together with Cyanet Codec and Microcoder. These were exclusively available from buying Yu-Gi-Oh! Legacy of the Duelist Link Evolution for quite a while. This means that anyone who was serious about playing Code Talkers back then technically forked over the money for this card, and they probably still have it to this day, most likely still wrapped in the plastic packaging. And at number 8, we have Defender of the Labyrinth, an Earth Warrior that takes two normal monsters to be made. Its effect buffs all non-effect monsters you control by 500 and debuffs your opponent's effect monsters by the same amount. It also has a floating effect where if it's destroyed by an opponent's card, it can reborn any non-effect monster from your graveyard. There are many ways to try and make normal monsters playable in the modern game, but this is not one of them. Defender is essentially the non-effect version of the Link 2 upgrades to the battle recruiters like Mistar Boy, except not only does it support a way worse tribe, it also came out far after these were playable anyway. The best thing about this card is that it is a way to turn tokens into an effect monster, but there's a plethora of other links that let you do the same thing while also having good effects. Even in decks that actually want to play some normal monsters, this card has no utility whatsoever. Blue Eyes and Dark Magician players have no reason to ever link off their flagships into this. And on the more competitive side, you'll never see two Sunsea Genius Lokais being used to make a Defender of the Labyrinth. The whole reason why people play these cards is the support around them. Sure, there are many hardcore fans of both DM and Blue Eyes White Dragon, but you probably wouldn't see so many of them trying to deck and master duel on their locos if they didn't have stuff like Eternal Soul and Blue Eyes Jet Dragon to give you a reason to play the old cards. Sun Avalon falls into the same line, except as an actual competitive archetype, it gives you like 8 interactions just off of putting their vanilla on the field and linking it off. If faced between having all of that, or your opponent's monsters just being slightly weaker, well it's obvious what anyone would choose. Just the same, no one is ever going to be choosing to put Defender of the Labyrinth in their extra deck for pretty much any reason. And at number 7, we've got Sun Avalon Daphne. This earth plant monster of course takes two plants to be made and has the same arrows as the last spot. Its effect makes it so it cannot be targeted for attacks, but lets your opponent attack directly. It can also, on a hard once per turn, tribute a monster to target two plant links into graveyard, except copies of itself, and shuffle them back into the deck. 
These kinds of recovery effects are by no means bad. In fact, quite a few meta-relevant cards have had them. Shoveling back resources into the deck can let you grind way longer than normal. The main difference is that often these effects are either just a bonuses stapled onto already good cards, like with Pure Leap, or they gain you advantage while recycling stuff, like with Galatea. Daphne does neither. In fact, it even has the huge cost of needing a monster to tribute. While it may seem right at home in the deck like Sun Avalon, since not only can they produce almost infinite materials, but they also often go through 12 or so cards from their extra deck turn 1. Daphne couldn't be more of a mismatch in there. If your deck goes off and you go through your whole combo, the last thing you'll need is a Daphne in your extra deck for turn 3. Your opponent will be dead on board by just turning things to attack. Even if they somehow aren't, you can just make your Thrasher for a swift OTK anyways. You also need to remember that this card competes with the Jasmine when it comes to Link 2 for the type, a card that can Rota and e Telly for plants just by itself. Even now with both Dryas and Healer on the limited list, people didn't give this card even a passing thought, as you can make up for it by just changing your combo line and playing more Sun Avalon Malleus instead of hoping to go through this to put stuff back mid-combo. Plant Link strategies have been pretty strong for the past couple of years, but it wasn't because of cards like Daphne. And at number 6, we have Galaxy Satellite Dragon, a Link 2 Dark Dragon with 2000 attack, which must be made using two dragons. During the battle phase, it can, as a quick effect, banish itself from the field or graveyard to change the attack of one of your Light Dragon number XC's monsters to be equal to the value of its number times 100, but any damage your opponent takes is halved. Then during the end phase, you can put any card from your deck on top of your deck. This card's effects are actually quite flavorful than its archetype, being able to either make the number your monster has in its name matter, or stack a rank up spell on top of your deck, but while that does make it an awesome nostalgia support for Galaxy Eyes, neither of these are particularly good things to be doing. The first effect is iffy at best, as while there are playable light Dragon Xyz numbers like Hope Harbringer, it's not really worth going through all the trouble to give it an 800 attack boost. The other one, number 100 Numeron Dragon, would actually go to an impressive 10,000 attack, but its own effect already often puts it on at least 9k anyway, at which point you're just making up for the halved battle damage. And while its second effect can be good, as you can stack game winning top decks or cards that need to be drawn to go off, then you're losing out on the best part about this card's first ability, it being usable from the graveyard. Most importantly, that means you don't need to keep this guy in the field and can link it off to the graveyard for its effects during the battle phase. The big reason why ending on this guy isn't something you want to do is because of how much competition it has when it comes to dragon links. You have Romulus, which is an amazing extender, or Heavenly Seals, the best interruption you could ever get off of a Link 2. Even if you look inside his own archetype, they already have Galaxy Eye Soul Flare Dragon, which does much more for the deck's game plan and is also interruption. So while Satellite Dragon does have a pretty interesting unique set of effects, it's much more fitting in an episode of the anime than in the actual Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG. And at number 5, we have Double by Dragon. This monster must be made with two Link monsters and its base attack is 1500, but it gains 300 attack times the Link ratings of the monsters used to summon it. It's unaffected by monster effects except Links, and it can't be shared by battle except by a Link monster. Double by Dragon is probably the easiest way to get an unaffected monster out. Still, since its protection doesn't apply to spells or traps, it's vulnerable to cards like Imperms and Talents both of which are huge staples that see play in almost everyone's deck. If that wasn't enough, since it's also vulnerable to links, it can be outed by cards that are basically in everyone's extra deck as well. Even if by some miracle you're going up against a deck that can't instantly out it, it's not like they're in any rush to do so. Having a double bite dragon on your field on the crackback isn't going to guarantee that you're going to win anyways. Tower's likes are only worth playing these days if being unaffected is just one of its traits, like how setting up Expertly Noir in the deck will often just give you multiple draws and spins. Meanwhile, all this dragon does is be a beater, and it's not even good at that. If you make it with a minimum investment, so two Link 1s, it starts off with a whopping 2100 attack. To get it to the 3000 threshold so they can actually contest stuff, you're going to need at least 5 monsters worth of materials. At which point, why would you even bother with Double Bite? For just one material more, you'd get to make the Arrival instead, who's in actual towers. For even less trouble, you can go into Underworld Goddess, which, even ignoring the fact that it can use your opponent's monsters as materials, has arguably better protection and as well as actual effects. And these are just two examples in the tower's niche, as you can also use these bodies to stop your opponent from playing or kill them instead. The point is that Double Bite can't even compete with its fellow Link 2s who only take a couple of monsters to make, and much less so with any of the respectable boss monsters the meta deck is going to have either. 
And at number 4, we have Binary Blader. An Earth Cyber set points left and right and has 1800 attack. It can only be made with two normal monsters and it gains effects based on the number of monsters co-linked to it. With one, you can make this card gain a second attack to the battle phase after it declares its first attack, but it can't destroy an opponent's monster by battle this turn. With two, after damage calculation, you can banish an opponent's monster this card battled. It's tough even knowing where to start with Binary Blader. Its materials are actually incredibly restrictive, needing two normal monsters exclusively, meaning that pretty much the only way to bring this card out is with tokens. The easiest way to bring two out would be to either use Draco Sack or the Link Devotee engine, but even with these, you're only getting your Binary Blader out. Now, good luck co-linking it twice. These kinds of effects need to be pretty good to be worth the amount to set up for several co-links required. Trigate Wizard gives you an Omni Negate as well as a Banish on your turn for your troubles. While with this card, well, you get to maybe remove a couple of monsters during the battle phase. It's not even protected by battle by itself, so unless you're also going to the trouble of co-linking it with a Nightmare, you'll be very limited in what you can crash into. Even in the best case scenario, the minimum 4 bodies you need to get this guy out and co-link it twice would also be enough to just summon Borosaur Dragon and be even better at beating over a board. Overall, it's very likely that Binary Blader will be as useful on the field as the textless tokens you linked off for it. And at number 3, we have Armalire the Star Leader Dragon. This is a Dark Dragon Link 2 with 1400 attack and downward pointing arrows. It needs two effect monsters to be made and can't be used as a link material. Its effect lets you target a face up monster this card points to, and then you special summon a monster with the same level from your hand to its other zone in defense position, but its effects are negated. The only way we could excuse Armalar for being as terrible as it is if it were one of the first Link monsters to come out. But while it does read like a starter deck card, it would only be available for us in the TCG in Dual Overload, the same set which brought us the likes of Halky Fibrax and Union Carrier. Armalire needs you to first have two monsters to use for its summon, as then a third monster to point to with its arrow, all so that you can summon out a fourth monster from your hand. If that wasn't enough, both these monsters also need to share a level between themselves, and you don't even get the effects off. If you just wanted to cheat a monster out from your hand, they've already made Saryuja Skulldred, which takes only slightly more effort to make, and gives you way more than just that as well. Still, this wouldn't even be the worst extender if you could at least link it off afterwards, but Armalire has a restriction to prevent just that. A card needs to be as powerful as a Rusty Bardiche to have that restriction and still be worth playing, but Armalire probably wouldn't even see play if it didn't. The only saving grace this card has is that Konami would eventually release Gigantic Sprite, giving you a way to actually get this off of your field by using it as an Xyz material. While it's not like Sprite would need a card to get level 2s out of their hand in the first place, all of their monsters do it by themselves anyway, but the small saving grace is what saves it from being the first spot on this list. And at number 2, we have Junk Connector. This is a Dark Warrior with arrows both pointing left and bottom right, and 1700 attack. It can be made with two warriors and or machines, including a tuner monster. Its effect is that during the main or battle phase, as a quick effect, you can synchro summon using only monsters this card points to. On top of that, if this link summon card you control is destroyed by opponent's card and sent to the graveyard, you can float into a Junk Synchro monster from your extra deck, and this is treated as a proper synchro summon. Now, Junk Connector is very much a product of its time, as it obviously is a shoehorned Link monster given to an archetype that has nothing to do with them, because of how Master Rule 4 crippled every other summoning mechanic in the game. However, this one might just be one of the worst of all of them. Its materials are needlessly restrictive, and while the Junk archetype is all warriors and machines, lots of generic extenders for synchros aren't. That would be bearable if it advanced your game plan somehow, but this card does nothing by itself. It takes 4 bodies just to set up its quick synchro effect, and even then the payoff for that is limited at best. While there are many synchros that are great to be brought out during your opponent's turn, like Satellite Warrior and Black Rose Dragon, it still sucks that you can't go for the absolute best one, Trishula, since it needs more than 2 materials. Additionally, there are already several other synchro monsters that set up spell speed to synchro summons, but much better, since they themselves have levels and on summon effects. Cards like Formula Synchron and Excel Synchron have been staples in these decks forever for a reason. Even if its floating effect is worthless, as the only junk monster that does anything worthwhile when being cheated out is Junk Speeder, but you can't even use its effect to turn you summon a Link monster. Talking about that, these two junk monsters came out in the same set for us in the TCG, and while Connector does nothing, Speeder straight up summons 4 plus monsters from your deck. Even in the OCG where Speeder only came out later, this card was outclassed on release because they had Halky Fibrax already which set up for an Excel Synchro on your opponent's turn basically by itself. There are some other really bad cards in this list, but it's tough to beat Junk Connector in the cards that have no reason to exist category. And finally at number 1, we have Link Bumper. 
This is an Earth Cyber Sling 2 that takes a couple of Cybers and has arrows pointing up and left. Its effect is that once per turn, at the end of the damage step, if your monster's card points to attacks an opponent's Link monster, you can give that monster an additional attack on each of your opponent's Links for each Link monster you control, except this card. Your other monsters can't attack the turn you activate this effect. Link Bumper manages to harness all of the bad qualities a Link 2 can have into a 1. It has restrictive materials, a really bad effect, and terrible arrows. Also, it makes it so that there's no reason why you'd ever want to run this card. Out of the gate, being restricted to Cybers isn't the worst thing ever, as pretty much all Cyber stacks are Link focused in the first place. But this also means that it has to compete with every other Cybers Link 2 out there. This means you're never going to pick this card over an actual good effect like Splash Mages Reborn. Even within its own niche of giving you more attacks in the battle phase, there's Update Jammer in that pool, who doesn't even need to stay in the field to do so. Even in the Earth Cybers niche created because of G Golem Crystal Heart, you'd probably be better off just running the generic Binary Sorceress instead. Moving on to its effects, its uselessness goes hand in hand with its arrows. Usually, when an effect requires you to point to something, they make it downward pointing arrows so you can use it without too much setup. Think about Sunlight Wolf and Galatea, who pretty much only need three monsters worth of materials to set up. Meanwhile, Link Bumper points up and left, which means that its effects aren't even usable if it's the first link that you make. So you either need to first link climb and then make it, or reborn it somehow later on. This also cuts the card's use as a generic link just for its arrows completely. The final cherry on this cake is that, even if you do go through all that trouble, it still ends up doing basically nothing. So you're going to need this card, pointing to a link that's a good attacker, and then even more links on the field so that it actually gets the extra attack, and then it can only do these extra attacks on link monsters. So your opponent's field has to be full of them as well. Imagine needing this much setup to just beat over stuff when Axis Code Talker and the Raging Phoenix line kill your opponent and clear the boards with much less effort. There isn't even a worse thing to convert two monsters into than this, and the only way they could have made it worse was if it also locked you into something somehow. Nonetheless, Link Bumper is still one of the biggest disgraces for the Link mechanic, and the worst card in this video. Alright, and that's the list. If you happen to know of any other cards you might have missed, or have any ideas for future videos just like this one, please let us know down in the comments below.